All right. Hello, everybody. I'm here joined with my colleague Mark uh, from the Semantic Kernel team, and we're going to be talking about the VS Code extension that you can use in the Semantic Kernel uh, or with the Semantic Kernel to help you develop your skills, your plugins, and ultimately help your uh, developer journey uh, with AI and large language models. So I'm going to introduce or pass it off to to Mark to kind of say a few words, and then we'll we can dive right into into the extension. So Mark, do you want to go ahead? Okay. So um, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Mark Wallace. Um, I've been working for Microsoft for about two years. Um, I've been working on the semantic kernel team for the last but maybe about three or four months. Um, like I'm based in the European Development Center in, in Dublin in Ireland. Um, we've got a small team kind of like working on semantic kernel here. Um, my focus has been on uh, developer um, tooling um, and principally looking at the um, the VS Code extension. And I'm also involved a little bit in the semantic kernel core, like looking at the the Java port, um, helping the team out who are working on that on that. So very cool, very cool. And yeah, Mark, do you want to kind of give some background of what this VS Code extension is and why it exists, what what purpose it serves? The initial motivation behind the extension was we wanted to provide a way to make the semantic kernel more accessible. OK, so we wanted to give developers an entry point into um, AI development, something that was simple to get started with that could guide them through the process of kind of like, you know, learning the key concepts involved in semantic kernel. We wanted to kind of complement the approach of the code first approach that we have with the semantic kernel with the open source project. Right. So give people some tooling. Um, and the, the main goal was we wanted you to be able to go from zero to having an application running in your environment and have all of the key concepts being able to execute them. Like, you know, that's that's principally what we're we were trying to do. Well, without further ado, can we see what the maybe we want to pull up the page, the uh, um, marketplace page? Yeah, sure. So, yeah. So let's start. Um, with basically where you go to kind of like to get the extension, right? So if you go to the Visual Studio uh, Marketplace in the Visual Studio Code um, section and you, and you search for Semantic Kernel, um, you'll see the tool here. So you can basically, you can download it directly from Visual Studio Code or you can download it from the website and, and then install it. Um, there's some useful information here to help you kind of get started. Like, you know, there's a few, there's some step-by-step -step guides on um, creating a semantic um, skill, executing a semantic function, you know, so you can follow follow along. Most of this stuff is, uh, we think, is reasonably intuitive as well. Um, there's also a change log here, so you can basically you can track the um, the releases as they come out. Um, we're trying to release every couple of weeks as we kind of get new functionality. And we've been working with some people who who are using the um, the extension, so they've come back to us with specific requirements, and we try and get those addressed um, very quickly. Um, but what I'll do now is I'll I'll show you, um, I'll, I'll show you the the extension in action, right? So 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 what I have here is I've got Visual Studio Code, and I have a an application open, which is a semantic um, kernel application. So um, this is a starter application that we provide. Um, it's a C sharp starter application, and it just does the very basics. It's your hello world um, starter. Now you can actually create this starter um, from the um, semantic kernel extension. So what I'm going to do is if I go to the command palette, and um, we've got a a walk through for our extension, right? So this is a standard thing that you get with Visual Studio Code extensions, right? So you can see there's a bunch of walkthroughs here for all the stuff I've installed. I've got one for the semantic kernel. And um, if you go through the steps in the walkthrough, and I've gone through the first couple of these already, um, I've created a new application. I'm able to preview the application. I have it configured so I can um, use AI endpoints. And um, and then I've played around. There's actually some semantic functions already included in the, in the starter, so I've played around with those, those a little bit. But um, as a getting started, um, somewhere for you to get started, you can basically kind of go through this walkthrough, follow all the steps, and you'll have your first application up and running pretty quickly. Like it should take you, you know, a matter of minutes to kind of get going. Um, 
the I have the extension installed here. Um, you can get to it by going to kind of like, you know, the marketplace. And again, if I type um, semantic kernel, um, you can see that you can install it directly. You can install it directly from here, right? But I, I have it installed already. So if you go to, um, if you open up the extension, we have um, a set of views that we provide. And what they're giving you is they're giving you a particular view of the project that you currently have open, right? So it just focuses you on the semantic kernel related artifacts within that within that project, right? So the first artifacts that you want to look at are what are, we call semantic functions. So, so these are basically prompts. So if I um, open up one of these, you can see a prompt. It, this is the natural language that we send to the AI. And um, our prompt supports some, some templating. So you can see here we have um, input variables. So um, what this prompt is going to do is it's going to write a joke for me. I want to um, provide a style for the joke and also a topic for the joke, right? And we can provide those as variables. So when I execute the prompt, this is information that I that I need to provide. Um, we have some, you know, some syntax highlighting here. Um, and we also have kind of like some IntelliSense, right? So I can recognize here that I'm entering in a, um, a variable and um, it'll give me um, it'll give me the, the variables that I can I can kind of like, you know, um, type in um, that are available. Look, so for, for this particular um, function, we've got two. We've got style and, and input. So you can then um, I'll just say that you, you can then um, run um, the function. Right. So I'm going to use the rerun option because I've run this function already. So I can um, execute it. It doesn't prompt me because I've run this previously. I've provided a style. I've provided an input already. So it doesn't prompt me for that information again. Um, so what I've asked for is I've asked for a joke, um, a, a you know, a dad style joke about horses. Like, you know, so I've got a teenage daughter who's crazy about horses. And um, so she appreciates the, these jokes. Um, so you can see it's come back. Um, this is the prompt that we're sending to the AI. So that's output here. Um, and then this is the result. So this is the question and then like um, and this is the response. And we can also see the number of tokens that were used. Right. So this is a good indication of how expensive this particular prompt is to execute. One of the key things or one of the neat things I, I see in this is that um, because it's like integrated, you have a syntax highlighting and, and all that inside VS Code. It actually makes the prompt creation experience a lot better right, than you would let's say normally, if, if I just, you know, wrote a separate text file or, or something else. Can you talk more a bit more about, I guess, what's happening maybe behind the scenes here to enable this? Maybe not everyone is familiar with our prompt templating and like what what that involves. So if you could speak a little bit on, on those fronts. Um, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So so ultimately, we're going to be sending natural language to the AI, um, but and anybody who's kind of got involved in this will know that, you know, everyone will be aware prompt engineering is a thing. Um, if you've done any of it, you'll be aware that it's it's quite difficult. You know, it's quite um, tricky because you're getting, you know, essentially non-deterministic responses and you want to, you know, a certain degree of determinism or at least um, you want to make sure that the AI is kind of giving you um, reasonable responses back. And um, so there's a lot of experimentation um, that's needed in putting together these prompts. But the, the sort of things that you discover when you get into this is that once you write a prompt, um, you'll want some variability within the prompt, right? So you want to be able to do um, substitution um, variables, right? Because you hear the style and the and the topic of the joke are going to change kind of constantly. And whatever prompt you're you're writing, if it was doing say summarization of data, the the content that you want to summarize is going to be different every time, right? So you need to be able to um, yeah, you need to be able to parameterize um, your prompts. Um, one of the other things that you'll find is that um, certain things that the AI is very good at and the certain things that it it's either not very good at or, or just can't do at all, right? So um, if you ask an AI to send an email, it'll come back with a response and it may think it sent an email, but it, it actually hasn't, right? Because it can't do that. So one of the things you want to be able to do is integrate what we call native functions into your prompts so that you can actually call 
um, a native function existing code to perform operations, right? So if I wanted to summarize the last 10 emails from my from my inbox, I'm going to need a native function that will retrieve those emails so I have the content and then includes the, the, um, that information inside the prompt and then we send it off to the AI. And um, we can do that with our with our prompts. We can um, specify not just variables here, but also calls out to um, to other functions to retrieve information. Okay, there's one thing that kind of happened here. We were able to run this this prompt. Um, we got a response, but like you know, there was a little bit of magic in terms of well, what AI endpoint did I use, right? So we have um, this view here which allows me to see the AI endpoints that I have access to, right? So um, at the moment I'm logged into Azure and um, it's showing me the subscriptions and it just filters. I've got access to a ton of subscriptions, but these are the ones that have AI resources um, deployed in, inside them. And um, if I navigate through these, I can go to, I can see under this particular um, deployment, I have I get, I have all of these models and I can basically switch between these models, right? And um, it's a little bit subtle, right? But in the status bar, you can see that I'm currently using Azure OpenAI Text DaVinci 003. Now, if I want, I can switch to, I could switch to something like Hugging Face. Um, and then I can do, say I decide I want to use a, a text to image, um, model here okay so just by clicking on it i've selected that if i rerun this prompt um again it's going this is um this is basically the the ai model that it's going to use right so it's actually going to try and generate a a funny image um, based on my on my prompt right um so you can see here something's been been executed um if i um or something's been generated here right so you can see here it's come back with um, fortunately, it's not it's not legible, right? But this is its attempt. This is this this partic particular model's attempt at generating a kind of like you know a funny image based on on, on my prompt. Um, yeah, so we can switch easily between OpenAI, Azure OpenAI, and Hugging Face at the moment, and this makes it easy then for you to just select the um, the model that you want to use, and also also switch between the different models. And, um, you know, so one of the things you, you want to be able to do is actually, like if I switch back to Azure OpenAI, um, I ran the last time with Text DaVinci um, 003, which is reasonably good. I want to change to 002, all right? And I'm going to run um, the same prompt again. This is the sort of experimentation that you want to do when you're doing um, prompt engineering, right? You want to swap between different models and and see kind of like you know what type of results you get and see kind of like you know what number of tokens kind of um are being used dependent depending on the model right so um yeah so we have in the output here we ha there's a stream of all the all the results that we're getting back from the ais it's all displayed um out here at the moment right but uh, obviously this isn't the most convenient way if you want to compare different results so we have um the next thing down is that we have a results view um, if I bring up the results for my um, fun skill joke, um, you can see it's displaying them here in a, in a table. And um, I can see kind of like, you know, the various results and I can basically compare um, things against each other. Um, you know, and uh, I can see kind of like, you know, the number of tokens that were used for, for different executions. Um, and these are the configuration settings that I used when I called that particular model. So if I, the other thing that we can actually vary is are these um, parameters, right? So I can vary things like the temperature or the presence penalty. So um, in order to do that, if I go back to my prompt and um, I have, we have this configuration file that sits beside the prompt, and this is where you can actually um, configure, say, the completion settings that we're using when you actually um, execute that particular prompt. Okay, um, and these ones are specific to open AI uh, models so like so they're not going to be relevant if you're using um, hugging face for example like you know so we don't send send this data across okay, so just to kind of recap what we just saw right we saw you being able to first create skills create create a create a function um, that uses that takes in some input that can be parameterized and and execute against some model right but 
the powerful thing is that without any code written, you can now also just swap the model endpoint so that you could evaluate whether using a cheaper model like, let's say, GPT-35 Turbo versus GPT-4, how that performs on your given skill. And the other thing that I saw that was really cool was that um, it's not just text generation that this works for. Uh, this, uh, for now, right, also works for image generation uh, with with a prompt. It, it just all fits within VS Code, right? And I think that's super powerful. And if you want to bring it back to the, the results view again. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think even just having this like across, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is across all your runs that you've that you've uh, uh, accumulated, or or how is it? Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, that's it exactly. Like you know, so if we look at um, these, all get stored in just a, a a particular directory within your workspace or whatever, right? So here we've got a nice view, but they're very discoverable. Like if I come back here, we have you can see we have the semantic kernel um, folder that was created. And uh, these are just JSON files, right? So um, for my excuses, um, yeah, I can see exactly the same thing. So I can select it here. I don't. We don't need to go to the semantic kernel view to see these things. We can just um, select the um, the JSON file, and then you can yeah, you can see the results um, of the executions that I've done, right? Yeah. And again, re-emphasizing that this is all just pure prompt engineering. You don't even have to necessarily be a C sharp developer to at least inter interact or play with these things. So one value add or one value proposition of this is that, yeah, a non-technical or non-engineer can still participate, can still play around with prompts, you know, configure different uh, models, different parameters, uh, and, and still be able to, to generate some very cool things. Yeah, and then you can take what you've done, what you've built, and kind of like you know what you fine tuned using the tool, and then have it available, you know, within your kind of semantic kernel based application, then straight away or whatever. And you can, uh, and it's nice to have this kind of like history of results then as well, because you'll know, you know, you can see the the prompt that was used each time. So that's something that will evolve. Um, the model that was used um, each time, there are things you want to compare, and also the settings, right? Uh, and the, and obviously the result, right? So you can you can start to see a, like a history of what worked, what didn't, and if you need to revert back, you can kind of revert back and and do things like that, you know. Mm -hmm.